What role are we playing? Why it's not about you being unique. The social system does not consist of human beings. It consists of persons. And the whole system exchanges its personnel constantly. There's the same occupation, the same roles over a long period of time. And it doesn't matter who takes on those roles, those occupations. Because people are expendable. They can be exchanged when they need to be exchanged. All right, welcome everyone to this third installment of my Kafka series. Today I'm going to talk about the legitimacy of the trial against Joseph K. Last time I was talking about the uncertainty of the trial, its outcome, and also the importance of uncertainty for the trial itself. I was mentioning that the accused cannot be really involved in the trial. It's just a prerequisite of being able to run the trial. So this element of uncertainty was super, super weird, but also crucial for the existence of the trial itself. Now, let's just jump right in because it's going to be a lot to go through again. Joseph K. is confronted with this self-referential system. He has no access to it. He's actively and deliberately excluded from gaining any insight into its inner workings. The system possesses its own dynamic and it just does not allow outside variables to get into it. It's unintelligible to the individual, and this is on purpose. We've seen this in the paragraphs I've quoted. The accused is not supposed to be within the system, although the accused is being processed by the system, but still he's kind of like a bystander of his own case. So you can observe how he's processed by the system, but he cannot really access the system, which is kind of really, really weird. So the individual in this case loses his or her autonomy. And I want to give you a very significant scene of how the system's inner workings, its strange, weird inner mechanisms are. Um, and Kafka in the trial invents the figure, the character of a leather-clad flogger. Now, this is a very, very interesting character. Let's take a look at him. So the flogger's role, his sole purpose is to punish delinquents of the system within the system. So it's basically officials who are working for the system who have done something wrong or something that is negative to the system and its inner workings. The flogger shows up because K complains about the guards. There are two guards that are watching him and he is complaining that they're intruding. And so that flogger shows up and Kafka writes, Und nun erkannte K, dass es wirklich die Wächter Franz und Willem waren und dass der Dritte eine Rute in der Hand hielt um sie zu prügeln. Nun sagte K. und starrte sie an, ich habe mich nicht beklagt, ich habe nur gesagt, wie es sich in meiner Wohnung zugetragen hat. Und einwandfrei habt ihr euch ja nicht benommen. And now K. realized that it was really the guards, Franz and Wilhelm, and that the third one had a rod in his hand to beat them. Now, said K. and was staring at them, I have not complained. I've only said what happened in my apartment. And you have not behaved decently anyway. Now, so the guards are faced with their own punishment by the flogger who is sent by the system to punish, to beat, to physically beat the guards that are also working for the system. So the system itself has its own punishments for members of the system. And so these guards, Franz and Willem, they're starting to question the just nature of the system itself. So in that case, they have a new angle, a new view on the system and its justice. So because now they become the objects of the system themselves. Kann man das Gerechtigkeit nennen? Wir zwei, insbesondere aber ich, hatten uns als Wächter durch lange Zeit sehr bewährt. 
Du selbst musst eingestehen, dass wir vom Gesichtspunkt der Behörde gesehen gut gewacht haben. Wir hatten Aussicht, vorwärts zu kommen und wären gewiss bald auch Prügler geworden, wie dieser, der eben das Glück hatte, von niemandem angezeigt worden zu sein, denn eine solche Anzeige kommt wirklich nur sehr selten vor. So they say, can you call this justice? The two of us, but especially me, we have done everything we can to be decent guards. And you have to admit yourself, judging from your standpoint, from the standpoint of the authorities of, of the system, we have been good guards. We had the prospect of being promoted and it is very certain that we would have become floggers ourselves like this one. He was just lucky that no one had accused him of anything because such an accusation happens very, very rarely. It's interesting. So basically, becoming a flogger is a position of authority within the legal system. And everyone working for the legal system and within the legal system is dreaming of becoming a flogger because it gives you power over other individuals working in the system. So the flogger has a very, very prestigious and elitist position in the system. Unreliable individuals who have done something that might potentially destabilize the system and threaten the system's sustainability. So if they disrupt the processes of the system, they become a potential danger and they have to be disciplined. And so in this case, Kafka points at the fact that the system itself is based on force and violence. And also that the system is observing itself and its inner workings in order to make sure it is not threatened from the inside. It's interesting that Kafka is using the term flogger, what in German is actually prügler. And a prügler is just someone who beats up people. So it's just kind of like a rowdy. It's a very colloquial term. It's not a term that would be used in a legal context. So it kind of deviates from this legalese terminology. But the term flogger can easily be understood by anyone, by everyone outside of the legal system. It's just self-explanatory. And so basically flogger also characterizes the nature of the system whose sole purpose is to punish. So the nature of the flogger's occupation has manifested itself in the term flogger. And so every human individual within the system is just being reduced to his or her role in the system. And that's very interesting. So people are defined by their occupation, by their social role, let's say. And um, so it's not like uh, their individuality would count at all. It's not about their character. It's not how they behave. It's just who are you as a social person? What role are we playing? Well, it's not about like you being unique. And this is very important because in that case, we can say what, what Luhmann actually has referred to, that the social system does not consist of human beings. It consists of persons. And the whole system exchanges its personnel constantly. So there's the same occupation, the same roles over a long period of time. And it doesn't matter who takes on those roles, those occupations, because people are expendable. They can be exchanged when they need to be exchanged. That's very important. So it's like the system feeds on human beings, turns them into persons, into social actors with a certain role in that system. And when they are not usable anymore, they are just being disposed of. So every individual is expendable. No one has any individual unique value to the system. The system just consumes and devours human beings and turns them into social actors, basically. Now, the case of Joseph K. seems to be quite complicated. Suddenly, things take a weird turn. His trial seems to be kind of different from the usual trials the system conducts. So his case needs to be investigated with 
special care. Ich habe einmal in einer Schrift den Unterschied sehr schön ausgedrückt gefunden, der zwischen der Vertretung in gewöhnlichen Rechtssachen und der Vertretung in diesen Rechtssachen besteht. Es hieß dort, der Advokat führt seinen Klienten an einem Zwirnsfaden bis zum Urteil, der andere aber hebt seinen Klienten gleich auf die Schultern und trägt ihn, ohne ihn abzusetzen, zum Urteil und noch darüber hinaus. So ist es. Aber es war nicht ganz richtig, wenn ich sagte, dass ich diese große Arbeit niemals bereue. Weh tut sie, wie in ihrem Fall so vollständig verkannt wird, dann, nur dann, bereue ich fast. So it's the advocate talking to Kay. Only one time have I seen the difference in a document, the difference between representing someone in a regular lawsuit and representing someone in a special lawsuit. It says there, the advocate leads his client by a thread until the verdict is spoken. But the other one puts him onto his shoulders and carries him without letting him down until the verdict is spoken and keeps carrying him after the verdict is spoken. That's the way it is. But it wasn't completely right when I said that I had never regret this great work. Because like in your case, sometimes it's completely misunderstood and then, only then, I almost regret it. He almost regrets it. But he doesn't really regret it because, I mean, he's also playing a role in that legal system and his role is also to process these cases. He is part of the legal system. This is what Kay has to understand. The advocate, his lawyer, is also part of the system. So how much help can he expect from that lawyer? Because in a way, he's also feeding the system and he has to kind of cooperate with the system. So that means that Kay cannot totally trust him and rely on him. This is just the nature of the beast. And so, as everything in Kafka's The Trial, the whole situation is unreliable. Every single individual there is unreliable. K has no support whatsoever. He always meets those unreliable sources. People are telling him something about the trial that they've heard or that someone else has told them because that person has some significant insight, but it's all completely useless. In the end, he's just all by himself and has to face the machine by himself. So I can see here this outrageous discrepancy between K, who is an individual outside of the system, and the personnel of the system, which includes the lawyers representing K. He's changing lawyers because they let him down. And as I mentioned last time, the great advocates, I mean, they can't even be bothered, you know. So it's just something like he is still all on his own. No one will help him. No one will bother. He's just everything he has to do is just has to suffer through this trial and go through this process of being processed by the system. Denn den Advokaten und selbst der Kleinste kann doch die Verhältnisse wenigstens zum Teil übersehen. Liegt es vollständig ferne, bei Gericht irgendwelche Verbesserungen einführen oder durchsetzen zu wollen, während, und dies ist sehr bezeichnend, fast jeder Angeklagte selbst ganz einfältige Leute gleich beim allerersten Eintritt in den Prozess an Verbesserungsvorschläge zu denken anfangen und damit oft Zeit und Kraft verschwenden, die anders viel besser verwendet werden könnten. So the lawyers, the advocates, they are not able to suggest any improvements of the system to the court. That's not their role. Because, of course, I mean, they are basically part of the system. The system takes care of them. I mean, they're paid by the system. But, like, the accused, every single accused, immediately can think about ways to improve the system, to make it probably more just, or, let's say, a much fairer system. But this is just something that the lawyers cannot do. And here it suggests the accused should also not waste their time and energy on trying to improve the system. Because it's a static system, it's the way it is. They just have to go with it and suffer through this horrible process of being investigated and in the end being sentenced. 
And that's when the trial ends. That's when they get closure. No matter what the verdict is going to be, that's the end of it. And now Kafka includes a parable in his novel, The Trial, and it is called Vor dem Gesetz, Vor dem Gesetz in German, which means before the law. And I'm just going to quote that famous scene inside of the cathedral. Da das Tor zum Gesetz offen steht wie immer und der Türhüter beiseite tritt, bückt sich der Mann, um durch das Tor in das Innere zu sehen. Als der Türhüter das merkt, lacht er und sagt, wenn es dich so lockt, versuche es doch, trotz meinem Verbot hineinzugehen. Merke aber, ich bin mächtig und ich bin nur der unterste Türhüter. Von Saal zu Saal stehen aber Türhüter, einer mächtiger als der andere. Schon den Anblick des Dritten kann nicht einmal ich mehr vertragen. So, he says, because the door, the gate to the law is open as always. And the gatekeeper, he steps aside, the man bends down in order to take a look through the gate inside of the law. And when the gatekeeper notices that, he laughs and says, if it's so alluring to you, you can try. Although I prohibited it, you can try to step inside. But remember, I'm powerful and I'm only the lowest gatekeeper. But from chamber to chamber, there's other gatekeepers, one mightier than the other. And I cannot even stand the sight of the third gatekeeper. Even I cannot stand his sight. What's happening here is um, the man described in Before the Law is trying to get insight into the legal system, into the law itself. And we can see here one room leads to another room. There's gatekeepers in front of every room, in front of every chamber. And it is impossible to get to the last room because every gatekeeper will try to stop the individual from getting into the law itself. So it's a pointless endeavor, it's useless, it will not work out. So again, the inner mechanisms of the law remain hidden from the outside individual. And so the consequence is, the only way to get closure is just to accept the sentence, the punishment, and just live with it, well, or die with it, it depends. In Joseph K's case, he will receive the death sentence. Why this is? It's also not revealed. It remains unknown. But the one thing that is revealed is that Joseph K. just accepts his punishment, accepts the verdict, and just gives in to his punishment. The role played by the parable for him Gesetz in Kafka's De Prozess is a strong support for the idea that the novel contains a religious allegory The law is God, the highest judge, who remains hidden. We can only guess at his wants, and we do not know whether he holds us guilty or not until he condemns us. Thus, K's arrest does not affect the daily course of his life. He has no knowledge of the charges he must meet. The weight of the defense is, by regulation of the court, thrown on him alone. Alles soll auf den Angeklagten selbst gestellt sein. The officials of the law, like men of God, are cut off from ordinary life and belong to a complex hierarchy. Yet they demonstrate all sorts of human failings, and the verdict with the reasons for it are far beyond them. This is a very, very strong paragraph here. It brings in this metaphysical dimension. So I've mentioned like the all-seeing eye of God and compared it to the legal system and the way it permeates society and is surveilling every individual. It knows everything. And so even like the most private sphere of everyone's life is under constant observation by the legal system. And this, of course, means it has a kind of like divine power to it. Um, this is kind of very, very interesting because it sounds a bit like, it sounds more like Lutherism. Like you can be, you know, like a sinful individual. You can be the best moral individual 
ever. But in the end, you will not know how God's verdict will be because you're going to be judged at the end of your life and God alone will decide if you go up or down, if you go to heaven or to hell. And there's no way for you to influence his decision. Well, because you're not God, you're just a guy. How dare you think that you could influence the will of God? And how dare you think that you could influence the judgment of the law? But then again, and now it gets paradoxical, there is no natural law anymore. Well, there is like institutionalized modern post-enlightenment law, and it has taken the place of God. So there's no moral absolute anymore. What's good and what's bad, it's an arbitrary decision made by a bureaucratic system that is unintelligible for outside individuals. But still, it has the power over life and death of every single individual. And one can argue, is that just? Well, not if you take into consideration that modern society has eliminated God. It's like the Nietzschean death of God. It's nothing to be happy about. It's actually something very scary because now your fate, your life is in the hands of a kind of like abstract entity that permeates society. And these institutions, they feed on individuals to thrive and to perpetuate themselves. But are they moral? No, they're not. And of course, you have no access to them. But they're still in charge. And they keep on revolving. They keep on moving. They just do what they do. They just process human beings. They just process individuals in order to sustain themselves. This is their sole purpose. Their sole purpose is to continue to exist and to continue to play their role in society. So the only thing that Joseph K. can do is just escape into the hope, the wishful thinking that the trial against him is going nowhere. And in the end, they just give it up. But of course, this is not happening. Although it seems like the trial is meaningless, but it's still being conducted. He is still being processed by the system. And so in the end, the verdict is spoken. Vorausgesetzt, dass es überhaupt zu einem wirklichen Abschluss des Prozesses kommt, was ich sehr bezweifle, ich glaube vielmehr, dass man das Verfahren infolge Faulheit oder Vergesslichkeit oder vielleicht einfach sogar infolge Angst der Beamtschaft schon abgebrochen ist oder in der nächsten Zeit abgebrochen werden wird. So he says, if the trial comes to a real conclusion, which I doubt, I think it's much more likely that the trial is going to be just stopped because of laziness or forgetfulness, or maybe because the officials are afraid of continuing the trial. So it might have just been canceled. And so I think if it has not been canceled yet, it will be canceled, just stopped in the near future. So that doesn't happen. And Joseph K's hope is crushed, of course. So the trial is going on. He is still being processed. And so the only thing he can do is just give up. He just has to accept his fate. And so the final scene of the novel shows his execution. Kay is being picked up at home and led to a place where he's executed. It's a very, very eerie and surreal scene. It's horrible. Am Vorabend seines 31. Geburtstages, es war gegen 9 Uhr abends, die Zeit der Stille auf den Straßen kamen zwei Herren in Kars Wohnung in Gehröcken, bleich und fett, mit scheinbar unverrückbaren Zylinderhüten. Nach einer kleinen Förmlichkeit bei der Wohnungstür wegen des ersten Eintretens wiederholte sich die gleiche Förmlichkeit in größerem Umfang vor Kars Tür. So, on the evening before his 31st birthday, it was around 9 o'clock in the evening, the time when it gets silent in the streets, two men showed up in front of Kay's apartment. They were wearing suits, they were pale and fat, and it seemed they were wearing unmovable top hats. After some formalities had been exchanged in front of the door, because they asked to be allowed to get access to the apartment, they continued these formalities in front of the door when Kay stepped out. So the men 
who are there to pick up K are wearing formal dress. They are representing the system, and the top hats also indicate that. Their hats represent the authority of the system. They're messengers and executioners of the system, of the system's power. So they are personifications of the system's power themselves. Their attire, the formal clothing, the top hats, distinguish them from regular individuals of the world outside of the system. And the formalities exchange also indicate that they are their unofficial business. And they mean business because they're taking K away. In a way, you can say, yes, they're messengers, they're mediators of the system. They're there to execute K, which means they are angels of death. Why is K sentenced to death anyway? We don't know. It is something that I will talk about more in my fourth segment about the trial. So the question will be, why does K simply accept his death sentence? Why doesn't he run? Why doesn't he try to escape? Why does he just go with it? I will try to answer this in my next installment. So thank you very much for watching and I'll see you next time.